Relays, we're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. It appears that Rhiannon Dixon, Dixon is Dixon, set to Dixon, return Dixon. to action at least one more time before this year is out. She's set to return in December. We know of at least two matchroom cards set to go down in the month of December. Anthony Joshua's proposed ring return on the 17th and the Chocolatito versus Juan Francisco Estrada trilogy set to go down here stateside unless Matchroom is set to announce. Unless they're announcing another show, we can assume that Rhiannon is set to return on one of those cards. Presumably a card happening in the UK. We'll see if that's the case. In any event, it's very good of Matchroom to get Rhiannon out there before this year's out. Get her out one more time. Rhiannon Dixon, who sports a professional record to six wins, no losses, and no draws. No recorded knockouts, not yet, but don't let that fool you into thinking this girl can't punch. She's got a hell of a right hook. No, she can punch. She's an offensively minded, offensively gifted fighter. Offensively, she's very good. Rhiannon's coming off that decision win over seasoned journeywoman Adina Kiss. Very interesting fight. Before that, she took on amateur standout Majuba Uptil. Rhiannon's actually very good for a fighter that doesn't come from some deep amateur background. She's got a high ceiling. She's very talented. One of the more fresh-faced youngsters campaigning in today's lightweight division. Light Wait, that's where Katie Taylor still reigns as that division's undisputed champion. Rhiannon is one of the unbeaten up-and-comers, unbeaten fighters, set to make a splash in the years to come at 135 pounds, trained by Anthony Krola. Training alongside fighters like Unified Junior Middleweight Champion, GB member Natasha Jonas. I think young Rhiannon Dixon is picking up a lot of good habits, though there are still one or two bad ones she needs to correct before she's ready to take on more interesting opponents, interesting challenges. She debuted as a professional in 2019, fought two times that year, sat out all of 2020, fought two times last year, 2021, two times this year in 2022. This will be her third fight of this year if she does in fact return in December. Against an opponent that has yet to be announced, don't know who they'll match her against, but you have to figure given where she is in her career and the fact that she doesn't come from a deep amateur background, it will be a bring along kind of fight, a oh. developmental kind of fight, because that's what Rhiannon needs to be doing at this point in her career, developing as a fighter, continuing to develop. You know, she's very skilled. Offensively, she's gifted. It's defensively. Rhiannon Dixon is a southpaw. Because she's a southpaw, she is susceptible to a right hand, a right hand from an orthodox fighter. And I've actually seen her get popped with a couple of right hands her last few fights. The last fight with Adina Kiss, she got popped with a few right hands. She wants to take care of that. She wants to clean that up before she steps up in class, perhaps starts taking on more interesting fighters that pack a more interesting punch, more interesting than what Adina Kiss has to offer. The saving grace and the silver lining is that this is what she's supposed to be doing. She's supposed to be working on things and developing as a fighter. So I have no doubts her next fight will be yet another developmental fight. More rounds in the bank for Rhiannon. Making good use of the time. You can look for her ring return sometime in December. In other news, Connor Ben is being investigated over claims that he failed another drug test earlier this year for the same clomiphene substance which saw his blockbuster fight with Chris Eubank Jr. canceled. In the 11th hour last week. You almost get the sense that they want to make an example out of Connor. The ideology might be that while you can't catch every fighter that's doping, the ones that you can catch, the ones that you do, you nail them to the wall and you make an example out of them. And that might make sense if that's what we've been seeing in the sport of boxing, but that's not what we've been seeing in the sport of boxing. There are many prominent figures. Some more well-known than others, some with more notoriety than others. Anyone from an obscure German-based heavyweight manual char to a more prominent, dominant figure in the division, like a Tyson Fury, the sport is rife with doping. And it's hard to argue that the sport itself and those that govern it have gone out of their way to make examples out of these fighters, these fighters that test positive for banned substance. So what sets Conor Ben apart? Why does it feel like they've taken special interest in nailing him to the wall, making an example out of him? This damning claim will expand dramatically not only British boxing's inquiries into the controversial last-minute cancellation, but also questions over the ability of the British boxing authorities to conduct There's your answer. effective drug testing procedures. If it seems like they're going after Connor Ben in a way that perhaps might feel like they're going after Connor with more spirit than they exhibited 
in other situations with other fighters that tested positive for banned substances. It might feel like they want to crucify this kid. They want to nail him to the wall. If it looks that way to you, it's because they themselves, the powers that be, the BBBOC and UCAD, have been implicated in all of this. That Ben now appears to have previously tested positive for what is claimed to be the identical drug which scuppered the fight makes a ban seem inevitable. One potentially even longer than the customary four year suspension for a single violation, which could keep this 26 year old out of the ring into his 30s. If it feels like the BBBOC and UCAD is working hard to nail Conor Ben to the wall and make him an example, more so than they have in previous instances with different fighters. It's because they themselves have been implicated in all of this. If these reports are true and Conor Ben did in fact test positive for this same banned substance before, why was he allowed to fight? Did the BBBOC know about it? And what did they do? How did he get past them? And why are we just now hearing about this? If he did in fact test positive for this substance before. It's no secret that a British fighter has failed a drug test, but lawyers are trying to prevent the WBC and the British Boxing Board of Control from releasing details. Frank Warren, Britain's senior boxing promoter, said. And I'm sure that he's enjoying all of this and how poorly it reflects on Eddie Hearn. Sitting on his high horse when his top draw, the fighter that he promotes, Tyson Fury, he's no stranger to banned substances or the scandals they create. He had one of his own a couple of years ago that everybody seems to have forgotten about. This potential bombshell also throws into doubt the prospect of this multi-million pound fight going ahead at a later date, as promoter Eddie Hearn is hoping. One eminent source in world boxing, when pressed to confirm the hitherto undisclosed positive finding, said on the condition of anonymity, yes, earlier this year, same stuff. That substance, clomiphene, was originally created as a fertility aid for women, but when used by men, it is a powerful testosterone booster and a drug masker banned in all mainstream sports, Olympic athletics and cycling included. This anonymous source that Daily Mail spoke to is the one claiming that Connor failed the test before and they covered it up. But unless somebody can provide some kind of documentation, some proof that he has in fact failed the test before, it's neither here nor there. It's a baseless accusation unless there's corroborating documentation. Most anyone who maintains their anonymity can claim to know anything. Because they're maintaining their anonymity, they're free to say anything and not be held accountable for it. Eddie Hearns has talked of how postponement of Eubank versus Bend at the weekend should have awaited confirmation of his fighter's positive A sample. But B tests require a request from the fighter hoping to clear his name. One expert close to the case said, this has not happened with Ben, and that is the cause of the delay. The fact that Ben isn't requesting they open his B sample. The exact dates for the taking and testing of Ben's previous A test are yet to be disclosed. But there are indicators of the timeline in his interactions with the clean boxing program run by the WBC in conjunction with VADA, the Voluntary Anti-Doping Association. Ben was erased from the WBC World Rank this January for failing to enroll. A month earlier, he had scored a surprisingly stunning fourth round knockout victory over seasoned American Chris Algieri. They're saying the reason this process isn't moving along faster is because Ben hasn't requested his B sample be open. And the reason for that might be, as damning as this might sound, the reason for that might be because, well, what's in the A sample is in the B sample. It's the same sample. It's essentially the same sample split in two parts, collected the same day. So what's in the a sample? Likely in the B sample. Ben hastened to join the program. In his only subsequent fight in April, he knocked out South African Chris Van Heerden in equally startling fashion. Van Heerden has since said, I have to wonder now if Connor was using anything for our fight. It is the hardest I've ever been hit. I just thought, wow, where's that come from? Ben was then welcomed to the clean boxing ranks and currently stands fifth in the WBC's welterweight ratings. If ben was dope. Why the hell did he join the clean boxing program? That just made it harder to hide. It's likely because he wanted to maintain his rank with the WBC. Had he not joined, he would have stayed erased from their rank standings. He lost a lot of ground. It seems certain now that he will shortly be delisted or dropped to below 
2015, where he would not be eligible for a world title challenge. Not like he was going to get one anyway. Errol Spence has the WBC title, and he's all tied up with those negotiations in reference to the Crawford fight. It's bad optics. All of it. It does seem like Conor Ben had something to hide, and he should have done a better job of hiding it him and his team. Kind of Ben who took to his social media and posted an Instagram story that reads, I hope the apology is as loud as the disrespect. Hey, that's assuming you can explain this and give them some reason to have to apologize. For what reason would you be taking a women's fertility drug? Not a lot of ways to explain that. As for the seven-figure purses for Ben and Eubank, the British Boxing Board of Control are expecting a storm of activity, including lawyers this week, but insist, as it stands, this fight will not take place under our jurisdiction. One option for Hearn, saving a tidy fortune, is to take the fight to the Middle East with Saudi Arabia the most likely destination. But the main priority is for the Saudis to secure the rights for Usyk versus Fury. In the coming spring's first fight for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world since Lennox Lewis held all the available belts almost two decades ago, whether the kingdom would be prepared to tarnish that main attraction by involvement with the Ben controversy will be fascinating. What's even more fascinating is that whoever wrote this article claims to know what the Saudis' priority is. is there actually an offer from Saudi Arabia to do Usyk versus Fieri? Is that confirmed? Did you speak to anybody in Saudi Arabia? Did Frank Warren, did he mention anybody? These are all very bad optics for Eddie Hearn, for Conor Ben, but also the BBBOC and UCAD, because these reports, based on what an anonymous source told Daily Mail, and what that unnamed source is saying is that Conor Ben has failed the test before, but if he did, how did he get past UCAD? How did he get past the BBBOC? If you go by this story, whoever this anonymous source is, they're indirectly implicating UCAD and the BBBOC. Whether Connor Ben slipped past them without their knowledge or they helped him cover it up. They helped him cover up a positive test in the past. It's bad optics for them as well, and that might leave them feeling so inclined to make an example out of Connor Ben. Dish out the harshest punishment to get the heat off of them. It looks like it's going to get messy, and it looks like Connor Ben has an uphill battle in front of him that doesn't involve Chris Eubank Jr. I don't get the sense they're going to reschedule that fight. You know, now that Chris is free, he can see about moving into a Golovkin fight. No catch weight necessary. Golovkin didn't retire. He's still a champion at middleweight. Earlier this year, Chris Eubank Jr. said he wanted to fight him. Based on how he looked with Canelo, I think that sentiment hasn't changed. Kind of Ben's all tied up with this legal battle, which could take months. He's got his own problems. And finally, just in keeping with the theme of rumors, what are perhaps baseless rumors and accusations per tweet from Michael Benson, Eddie Hearn has insisted that no approach has been made to Chris Ariola for a potential fight with Anthony Joshua next. And I figured as much. I figured that when rumors were swirling last week of Chris Ariola of all people, being approached for a Joshua fight. Anthony Joshua doesn't fight people like Chris Ariola. Tyson Fury, on the other hand, look at who he's fighting. Derek Chisoria, who's got losses in the double digits, and he actually fought this guy and beat this guy two times before. My honest opinion was that if anybody started that rumor, it was either Tyson Fury or Frank Warren in an effort to continue to slander Eddie Hearn and Anthony Joshua for what was supposed to be their fights collapse with Tyson Fury. They want to downplay whatever AJ's doing as much as they can because if he sticks to the schedule and he returns on the 17th, they have to compete with whatever he's doing. I mean, if anybody would want to lie about something like this and start a rumor like this, Frank Warren and Tyson Fury. Did you notice how vocal Frank Warren and Tyson Fury and his dad still are about the Joshua fight? It's over. It's done. It's not happening. It's done. What are you still doing interviews about a guy with no belt coming off of two consecutive losses? If it was Anthony Joshua that won the lottery ticket, according to you guys, what are you still talking about him for? He's not talking about you. I'm just pontificating, just hypothesizing, just bouncing ideas around, and I wouldn't be at all surprised to find out that that rumor about an Areola fight, it came from either Frank Warren or Tyson Fury. That's the kind of guy you'd expect Tyson Fury to fight before you'd expect Anthony Joshua to fight a guy like that. Anthony Joshua don't fight guys like that. The guys he fights, most of the time they're top 10 or top 5 guys.
Where is Fury? Fury's the kind of guy fights a surface of furry, a Francesco Pianetta, a Derek Chisora. Right now he's trying to convince the paying public that Derek Chisora poses the same threat to him that Oleksandr Yusik would, even though Oleksandr Yusik beat Derek Chisora. But never mind the facts. Facts are never important when it comes to Tyson Fury and the words that come out of his mouth. I'm telling you, Fury versus Chisora 3 is a tough sell. And if Tyson Fury decided to revisit that fight, it's in the hopes that Derek Chisora might help him sell it. Because somebody else, somebody like a... The Brits don't know who Agit Kabayel is. They might know who Joe Joyce is, but Joe Joyce for Tyson Fury is a high-risk, low-reward guy. So is Martin Bacoli. Joe Joyce or Martin Bacoli would be good dance partners for a box office Tyson Fury fight, but he doesn't want to have to work for his money. He doesn't want to put himself in a situation where he might get dinged up en route to a Usyk fight. He wants an easy one. The problem with wanting an easy one is, generally speaking, people don't pay box office prices to watch you take it easy. I think this rumor came from Frank Warren. I think it came from either Frank Warren or Tyson Fury because they're projecting their own inadequacies on Anthony Joshua, as if Anthony Joshua would fight someone like Chris Ariola. You might. You better tell Tell your lies while you still can, while nothing official has been announced. Eddie Hearn has just dispelled that rumor, that baseless rumor, but we don't yet know who it is Anthony's going to be fighting if he does, in fact, end up fighting on the 17th. He can fight Zile Zhang. He can fight Otto Valin. He can build himself up to a Philippe Pergolvic fight. Get in line to fight for the IBF title or get in line to fight the winner of Fury versus Usyk if that fight happens. If that fight does happen next year, whoever Anthony ends up fighting, that fight will likely have more sizzle than Tyson Fury's fight because you've actually seen Tyson Fury's fight that opponent you've seen that already two times before whereas anthony being less than perfect having so much on the line creates intrigue creates sizzle because he's not an unbeaten fighter but it's not a foregone conclusion that he wins he could lose and he still has more to lose can he get himself back in the winner's bracket can he really rebound off two consecutive losses to the same man these are the kind of questions that make you tune in these are the kind of questions that make you purchase a ticket or purchase a pay-per-view whereas with tyson fury you don't need to question if he can beat Derek Chisoria, he already has. Yeah. Two times. Yeah. So how the hell are you supposed to sell that? Frank better come up with some ideas. He better come up with them fast. Because he's got a fight to sell regardless of what Anthony's doing.